Hello and welcome to today's broadcast. My name is Abidemi Nwato and uh, I want to welcome you to this our new our journey through the letter to the Ephesians. Okay, today is part five in in this series, and just a quick recap on yesterday. I won't go through the whole thing on just what we did yesterday. Um, we talked about uh, Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church, which was patterned after his own prayer for himself. You know that after thirty years, he was still praying that he might know God and know him better you know um he also prayed for the ephesian church that he might know him that god might give unto them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation that he might know him better that he would open the eyes of their understanding so that they might know what is the hope of his calling what is his inheritance in the saints and his power as at work for them who believe and that that power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted when he raised jesus from the dead that is the resurrection power it's the same power that he exerted when he ascended to heaven and when he enthroned him as well on the right hand of God. So it is that same power that that power is available for believers. You know, if you're a child of God and you believe, then that power is available unto you. You have access to that power. All we need is just to believe. That's why Jesus said to um, the guy that came to him, you know, about, <laughs> about, he actually said it to Jairus, you know, Jairus, the, the um, synagogue leader, ruler, whose daughter was, you know, sick unto the point of death. And then while he was talking to Jesus, they actually sent a message to him to say that, oh, don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. The first thing Jesus said to him, look, do not be afraid. Only believe, because that is the only thing that, you know, taps into that in, uh, incomparably great power of God, the resurrection power of God. So we need to work on our believing, okay? Because there's nothing wrong in the flow of the power of God. It's available. In fact, we don't even need God's permission to be able to tap into his power to work for us. All we need to do is to believe. And then we, we uh, rounded it up by looking at um, the fact that God has exalted Jesus uh, above all power, all rule, all authority. And he has given him a name that's above every other name. That at the mention of that name, every name will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay. Um, and then we rounded it up by saying that, you know, Jesus is the head of the body, the one who fills all things. He is the head of the body. Okay. And all things, God has put all things, verses 22 and 23 of chapter 1, that God had put all things under his feet. And made him to be the head over his body. You know, his body is the uh, believers all over the world. You know, or in every nook and corner of the world we're there, okay? And no matter how ungodly the, the uh, government or the regime is, they cannot uh, stamp out uh, believers, okay? So the Bible says that he has put all things, all those powers, all those authorities, you know, he has put them under his feet. Guess which uh, part of the body the feet is. The feet is the lowest part of the body of Christ. So it doesn't matter where you and I fit in. Maybe I might just be a tiny little part of the toenail, <laughs> the small toenail or whatever. I am still part of the body of Christ. And that means that the enemy and all his cohorts and all that they are up to, they are still under our feet. But remember, it's in Christ Jesus. Okay, as long as we are in him and we believe him, the devil and all his cohorts are under our feet. Okay, so like I said yesterday, it's um, unchristian for a child of God to be afraid of the enemy. Okay, and like I was saying to somebody, I said, um, why do you have to fear <laughs> the enemy? I mean, the worst that could happen to anybody is for them to go home, which is a good thing. But having said that, because the enemy is already defeated, God has given us the authority. So there's no point for us to be afraid. We need to rise up in boldness and in confidence, you know, and rule and reign. The Bible says that those who have been given the gift of righteousness and the abundant provision of God's grace shall rule and reign in life through Christ Jesus. Remember, everything is still in Christ or through Christ or with Christ. Okay, not never outside of Christ. You and I are nothing and we can do nothing outside of Christ. But in Christ, we can do all things. Amen. Through Christ who strengthens us. 
Okay, so today we're going to go on to uh, chapter two. <clears throat> and I'm going to attempt to cover verses one to ten, but it's such, it's full of so much powerful stuff. So I've titled today's as a uh, take off the old and put on the new. All right, take off the old and put on the new. So now, let me just read through it quickly and then I'll take it one verses, uh, I mean, one verse at a time. It says, um, Ephesians, letter to the Ephesians. Hang on, I've got it in the amplified version, which will be too lengthy for me to read. Okay, let's go to the NIV and let's read it in the NIV. It says, as for you, right? You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, wow, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparably incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hallelujah. What a powerful read. Just reading through it is enough to just get you charged up. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is one and two. Okay. The Bible says there that as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Okay. That's our status. All right. Before Christ Jesus, we're born uh, as a, uh, we have, we inherited the sinful nature and with it came death, separation, spiritual separation from God. So that's the way we were born. So every single human being is born that way and dead in, in, in our transgressions and sins. So that status of being dead, separated from God, manifests itself as transgressions and sins. Okay, Transgression simply means to go beyond the limit. Okay, To transgress. That, that's, that, that's actually referring to the act okay the action of going beyond the limit the limit that god has given us in his word so when we go beyond it when we actually act beyond that limit we are transgressing but here i can see it mentions both our transgressions and our sins that we we're dead in our transgressions and our sins you know jesus brought sin down to the level of our of our heart our thoughts life and our heart so uh, as far as sins, sin is concerned you don't even have to do it you know, like in transgression, to actually be guilty of it. So just the thought of it, meditating on it, makes one guilty of it. Just like he said in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, you know, that the person that, um, you know, lost after, looks at a woman and lost after them, or man, whichever, that that person has already committed adultery in their hearts, okay? So we see there that both, we were dead, we had transgression, we were swimming in it, <laughs> That's it. When you're dead, you don't you, you don't re react to anything. So sins, transgressions, I mean, that was normal for us and every human being. But then in verse two goes on that it says, "In which you we used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient." Okay, so we were in that state before. Okay, our that was that was our former status. Um. We followed the ways of the world, one. We followed the ways of the world, and two, we followed the way of the ruler of the air, or the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is the devil, okay? Which means that the ways of this world and the way of the ruler of the kingdom of the air is the same, 
Okay, the Bible calls him the God of this world, the G-O-D, small G-O-D of this world. That is the God of the systems, you know, the, the mindset, the systems, the way of doing things of this kingdom is actually, of this world, okay, is actually controlled by the devil. The Bible calls him the, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And of course, you know, it's anti-God, it's opposite to what God wants, right? Okay, so the Bible says that it, it uh, as we we followed that way, and then the Bible says that that same spirit is still at work in those who are living in disobedience. All right, we lived in disobedience before. We followed the way of this world. We followed the way of the of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, you know, and that way is the way of disobedience. Okay, now it goes on in verse three. It says. All of us also lived as if to, to remind us, <laughs> you know, sometimes when we look at some people, uh, it's as though, oh, these ones are just <laughs> too far gone. They can't be saved. Who says you and I used to live in that state before and God saved us. So if God can save you and I, then he can save anybody. Okay. We have no right to withhold the gospel, the good news from anyone. We need to let them make the choice. Let them hear it and make the choice themselves. Don't make the choice for them by not telling them. I know that sometimes when we don't tell them, we have already made the, made the choice for them. And that's not, that's not right. That's not fair on anybody. Okay. So verse three goes on to explain to us how the following of that way of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of uh, the air, how it operates, how it manifests, how it works. Remember, it's the spirit of disobedience. Disobedience against God. So verse three says... All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. One, and then following its desires, two, and following the thoughts. Verse three, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh, following its desires, and following its thoughts. So those are the three different ways that we, 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 we express that way of disobedience, that that way of disobedience is expressed, okay? It's in gratifying the cravings of the flesh. It's a, it's a case of uh, whatever seems right to you, then it's right. Do whatever seems right to you. No, no, that is gratifying the cravings of the flesh and then following its desires and its thoughts whether they are against God or not against God, it makes no difference. Following it is an expression of living under that spirit of disobedience, the spirit of the kingdom, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. All right. Now, and we know that system is against God. Living that way is against the way of God. And when we live against the way of God like that, you know, the Bible says that we are deserving of, we are deserving of uh, the wrath of what the Bible says, it says, by nature, we are deserving of the wrath of God. Okay. So that's the part of verse three. It says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, you know, sin, transgression, disobedience, you know, attracts the wrath of God, the punishment of God. Make no mistake about it. I think sometimes we, we fail to, to uh, say or make clear how much of um, a danger it is, you know, to choose the way of disobedience because it attracts the wrath of God. God is a just God. He's a merciful God as well. So we have his justice and his mercy. He encourages us to come on the side of his mercy, not on the side of judgment. If we choose to reject the side of his mercy, it offers us in Christ Jesus, then we remain under judgment. Okay. And God has to be just to judge sin. Okay. So the Bible says that by nature, when we live that way, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts which are against God, it means that we are deserving by nature of God's wrath. <clears throat> which means that how we live actually matters to God. And it shows who we are or where we are. That's why later on in, in the letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 4 and verse 22, we're going to read where the Bible talks about how we need to put off. It says here, 
Ephesians 4, 22 says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. That is when you give your heart to the Lord. The Bible says that if any man is in Christ, just a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. We talked about it yesterday, how that the Holy Spirit quickens you. We're going to see it a bit, a bit later as well. The Holy Spirit makes you alive. You are a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. So we have an obligation to put off our old self, our old nature, which you remember it has to do with our soul. The soul is not born again, right? So <laughs> the spirit is born again, right? But the soul is not. That's why we have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit to help us to renew our minds, to put off that whole way of living, of of gratifying the, 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 the flesh, the, the flesh, the, the way of thinking and of reasoning, you know, um, that is contrary to God. So uh, it says there in Ephesians 4.22 that we are taught, and this is one of the very important things that we need to do and give our hearts to the Lord, to be taught, you know, to recognize the newness of life that is inside of us, which is the nature of God, you know, and to put off the old man so that the new man can be expressed by the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? So, um, <clears throat> then also, if we look in Acts 26, verse 20, you know, the key to be able to do that, because someone might say, okay, you're telling me to put off the old and put on the, the new. How do I do that, you know? Let's look at the key here. In Acts 26, verse 20, you know, Paul was, when he was giving his testimony of how he's, um, you know, lived for God and how what he taught, he says, First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. So the key here is repentance. Putting off the old and putting on the new, the key is repentance. And what is repentance? It doesn't mean being sorry for what you did wrong. No, it doesn't just mean that that's part of it. You know, but sorry enough to change your mind, to live in the opposite direction, to move, change towards God <laughs> and away from the life that you lived before. That is true and genuine repentance. And that's what keys into the grace of God that's available unto us to be able to live the lifestyle that's on the inside of us. OK, repentance is the key. So don't tell me you're repented if you're still doing the same thing going over. You're not truly repentant. <laughs> Repentance, you know, like Paul said, we need to turn to God. We should repent. That is change our minds. Be sorry for what we did. Decide that we're going to live towards God. Uh, we live for God. We're not going to do those things anymore. And then turn to God and then demonstrate your repentance by your deeds. That is true gospel. Okay. Then let's go on to uh, verses four and five. You know, this is time is really flying. Oh, my Lord. OK, verses four and five says, but because of his great love for us, remember all that God did, you know, the grace that he made available unto us. It was all based on his love because we were deserving of wrath by nature. But because of his great love for us, the Bible says that because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, isn't that powerful thing there? He loves us. He's merciful towards us. You know what mercy means? It means that you don't get what you deserve. Okay. By nature, we are objects of God's wrath. But his mercy means that we don't get what we deserve. But instead, we get grace through Christ Jesus. All because he loves us. Okay, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Make no mistake about it. <laughs> this is why I like this letter. It keeps repeating it over and over. Listen, guys, you can't be proud here because this was written to a certain level of mature Christians. Okay, you know, they've gone beyond the average you know, but uh, Paul had to be calling them to order. Listen, guys, yes, I know <laughs> you're doing great, but don't forget it's by grace. Okay. So it says there, he made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. We didn't have to clean up ourselves because we're not capable of it anyway. Before God saved us. All right. We didn't have to, we couldn't even do that. And that's why it is wrong to um, encourage people to 
change their lives and then come to Christ because they can't do it. That's why Jesus is there to uh, get a hold of us and then change, bring about that change as we cooperate with him and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he made us alive even when we were dead in our transgression. This is so powerful. Like I said earlier, nobody is beyond salvation. Nobody. Because it was when we were still dead in transgressions that Christ saved us. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that we have been saved. Okay? And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Okay? He seated us with, with, with him in heavenly realms uh, in Christ Jesus. All right. He made us alive when we're dead in our transgressions. So, like I said, do not withhold the gospel from anybody because everyone can be saved. Just like you and I were saved while we were still in our transgressions, okay? God has power to save anybody. That's why, you know, he said to the disciples when they were talking about how, oh, um, the rich, it's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. You know, the disciples said to him, then who can be saved? Because the understanding that the mindset then was that, you know, it was the righteous people who are rich and so on and things like that. But he said to them, look, with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26, we read it yesterday. So God is able to save to the uttermost. So don't decide for people. Let them have the opportunity to hear the gospel and decide for themselves. Because nobody, nobody is beyond God's salvation. And all things are possible with him. Okay, verse 6. Uh, verse 6, rather, not verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Okay, so in verse 5, we saw that he quickened us, made us alive by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, it says, He raised us up with Christ and then he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Those are the things that we said the power of God accomplished in Christ Jesus yesterday. That great power that we're talking about. Raised Jesus up, okay? Uh, uh, effected his ascension into heaven and his enthronement on the right hand of God the Father. But the Bible is saying there the, here that he did exactly the same thing to us in Christ Jesus. So the same time when this was happening to Jesus, it was happening to us. Hallelujah. So the same thing happened to us. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He made us alive with him, raised us up with him, and seated him in the heavenly realms, all in Christ Jesus. Never outside of Christ. It's all in Christ Jesus. And verse 7 says, In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. You know, kindness is one of the attributes of God, which flows from us as well, as children of the Most High God. It's an expression of God's love. Okay, when you show kindness, you're showing love. All right? So the, the reason that God showed us so much grace, so much mercy, so much kindness based on his love is so that it, might, it, might, it would be a testimony, okay, in the coming age that God is rich in grace. He is rich in grace. For instance, we look at the life of uh, Paul, for instance, who was Saul of Tarsus. He was a murderer who went from place to place looking for Christians to destroy them. He was the one that orchestrated the stoning of Stephen. But for him to now be saved and be used to propagate the same gospel, that is the main reason why Paul really had a revelation of grace. Okay, and the Bible says here that God continues to do that so that in the coming ages might be so glaring that God is full of grace. Hallelujah. Verse 8, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. <laughs> Don't forget, it's all by grace. Grace is unmerited favor, something we don't deserve. Mercy, on the other hand, is <laughs> not giving us what we deserve. Okay, it said by nature we're objects of God's wrath, but God poured that wrath instead on the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. So that now we, by faith, can believe that the wrath that was due unto you has been taken by Jesus. So you can have the boldness and the confidence to access God's presence 
through Christ Jesus, by putting your faith in what he did for you. Okay, that he paid the price for your uh, misdemeanors, <laughs> for your transgressions and sins, so that now you can be reckoned with as being holy and blameless. That's what he said, we read in chapter one, that God predestined us to adoption, you know, in Christ Jesus, so that we can be blameless and holy in Christ Jesus. Okay. So it is by grace that we're saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So salvation is the gift of God. Even the grace, I mean, we know that that's, that goes without saying. Everything, you know, in that package of grace is a gift. But then it talks about, I, I also believe that, you know, this and this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. It refers to both salvation, the grace, and even the faith that we use <laughs> to access that grace. That is by just simply believing God. Faith is believing God that, you know, he means what he says. You know, he says what he means. And he has the power to fulfill whatever he promises. That is faith. Okay. So both the faith, the grace, which are the vehicle of our salvation, and the salvation itself are all gifts from God. In Romans 12 verse 3, you know, regarding the faith being a gift from God, we read, it says, For by the grace given me, okay, gift given by the grace given me as Paul talking I say to every one of you do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you so God has given us each one a measure of faith so the faith itself is a gift grace of course is a gift and also the salvation that comes through grace by faith is also a gift. It's all a package of gift. And all we need as human beings is just humble ourselves, acknowledge that we need Jesus. <laughs> we cannot save ourselves, cannot help ourselves, and just receive it. Stretch out your hand and receive the grace. Praise the Lord. Okay, so I'm rounding it up oh, pretty sharpish now. So verse 9, it says, And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast okay uh, works good works are good but they cannot take anybody to heaven this is so important the fact that somebody is good and is doing so many charitable work does not mean that they have a license or access or passport to heaven no the only way that one can get into heaven is jesus jesus said i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except by me that's the statement of truth. No other person has ever dared to say that because no other person is the way. Jesus is the way. And that is the only way and access to heaven. Now, after we get in there, we are now empowered and enabled to do good works that will determine, you know, the status that we exist, at the level of, of our existence in heaven in eternity. All right. So let's go on. It says, Verse 10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. There, there are the good works. We are, first of all, created in Christ Jesus. Remember, quickened in him, made alive in him, first of all. And then now we are created for certain good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In fact, let me read that verse 10 in the Amplified Bible. And it just, oh, it just throws so much light into it. So the Amplified Bible, um, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. This is so powerful. It says, for we are his workmanship. One transition says that he, uh, we, are, we are his masterpiece. You know, every artist has um, his or her own masterpiece. Something that they cherish. Something that... When they say, bring your piece of work, that's the first thing they will bring up. The best of their works. Okay. So he says, you are, we are his workmanship. His own masterwork. Masterpiece. A work of art created by God. Remember, we are created in him. In Christ. He says, if any man is in, is in Christ, he's a new creature. Created in Christ Jesus. He says, 
created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed. That's who we are. When you come into the Lord Jesus Christ, you're spiritually transformed. You're renewed, ready to be used. That's why you're a brand new creature. That's why if the enemy comes to you with some things in the past before you came to the Lord Jesus Christ and truly repented, if the enemy comes with those things, just tell him he's got to, he's got the wrong person because you know it's not you that did those things because you're a brand new person. Okay. It says there that um, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand. Remember, certain things in place beforehand, predestination, predestined, taking paths which he set. So God set certain paths for each and every one of us. After recreating us, set certain works that we need to do, taking certain paths that he had already set so that we would walk in them living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. So there's certain good life that God prearranged and made ready for us. Certain paths that he prepared for us to walk in, which you and I have a responsibility of finding out and walking in it. That's what we call fulfilling God's purpose for your life. That's what you call fulfilling God's destiny that's upon your life. And, you know, I believe that the task of every believer is to actually find that purpose and to fulfill that purpose. Um, by the grace of God, I have uh, uh, certain materials that would help in that uh, area to be able to discover one's purpose, God's purpose on your life, and so on and so forth. So, if you need help, let me know. I'm going to call it a day here, so we'll carry on to, uh, on Monday. So, have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy church service, however you do it. And don't forget, Sunday, 5.30 p.m. UK time, on revelationtv.com. Uh, Summit Life is the program that we run there. So it comes on 5.30 p.m. UK time every Sunday. So watch it and be blessed. So for now, God bless you and God keep you. I want you to comment. I want you to, um, you know, like and share. Click notification button. And if you watch it on YouTube, make sure you do the same. Comment, like, share, you know, click the subscribe and the bell button. And uh, I'm sure this has been a blessing and let it bless other people as well. So I'll see you on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. Bye for now.